I'm like, what? Like, y'all, I don't know how much more of this season I can watch. Roxy says we're gonna talk about it. Roxy says we're gonna talk about it. What's up, y'all? It's your girl, Roxy, with Roxy Says, and we're going to talk about it. So we are reviewing episode three of season 15 of Real Housewives of Atlanta. First and foremost, let me say, I don't know what it is, but this season isn't doing it for me. Honestly, it took me like three days to finish this episode, right? There is a bandwagon of people saying that there needs to be a shakeup, like a complete cast shakeup, like all new girls, and I'm kind of leaning towards that. Like, y'all could bring back Nene because we're needing her. I want Portia back. Um, Sheree can go. I'm tired of seeing Sheree on my screen. Sonya can go. Um, I do like Candy. Who else is on the cast? Who else is still on the cast? Drew, I don't really like Drew, but she got a lot of drama coming up. So we could keep her around. We could keep her around. And who else is on the... What's that? Courtney could go. Marlo could go. It's just... I used to really love Real Housewives of Atlanta and it's just not giving. Tell me what you think below. Are you enjoying the season so far? Are you suffering through each episode? Is it entertaining? Tell me what you think below. Let me know how you feel about this season so far. Do you think that there needs to be a complete cast shakeup or do you think that some people need to come back and some people need to go? Let me know your thoughts because ciao. I barely made it through this episode, but let's get into it because it was still a little bit messy. So Marlo and Sonya meet up with Sheree at her chateau to discuss BravoCon. They just came back from BravoCon, so they're just recapping everything that went down, right? So of course, Marlo, because she's on Candy's ass, she brings up the comment that Mama Joyce made at BravoCon where they asked her between her mother and Don Juan, who would she like to be in charge of her estate, of her finances, should she happen to pass away. And Candy says that she would prefer to be Don Juan because she thinks that if it's left up to her mother, Mama Joyce, she wouldn't be so kind or so generous to her husband, Todd, right? So when Mama Joyce gets on stage, they ask her to say three nice things about Todd. And she says, well, he's short. <laughs> and then they play a clip of her speaking on Todd's job once again, that he doesn't have a real job, right? And at this point, Mama Joyce, like, we know you don't like Todd, but it's it's ridiculous at this point. It's ridiculous on Mama Joyce's part, and it's ridiculous on Candy's part. And I don't even rock with Todd like that. I think that Todd is stingy as hell. I think that Todd has no problem taking full advantage of everything that he can gain from his relationship with Candy. But I'm still stuck on when Candy wanted to gift his daughter, Kayla, with the car, he was like, no, she needs to struggle. Like that struggle mentality is so gross to me. Yo, I struggle, so my kids gotta struggle. Isn't that what you're working hard for? So that your kids don't have to struggle? Isn't that the goal? So that situation alone made me really look at Todd a different way because you are not struggling with candy. You're using every opportunity that you can to grow your business, whether it be the exposure from the show, whether it be Candy's money, your combined income, whatever it is, you're taking full advantage of it. We don't know what's happened since then, right? Maybe Todd has let Candy buy Kayla 50 cars. We don't know. But that situation did make me give Todd the side eye. And from there, I didn't really like Todd that much. So I'm not going up for Todd. But when it comes to Mama Joyce and Todd, lady, they've been together for a long time. They have two children together get over it. And Candy still fails to set boundaries with her mother. Listen, I love my parents. I value their opinion. I'm respectful to my parents, but I still keep boundaries with my parents. <laughs> they know they can't go around saying anything crazy, talking crazy to me, talking crazy to the people I love because I don't do that to them, right? We're adults. Candy, you're an adult. You're not a child. You don't have to accept your mother disrespecting your husband just because, oh, that's my mama, that's my mama. No. No, you, no, that's not right. And we've seen Mama Joyce do this year after year after year. So it's like, okay, either Candy's gonna say something about it or she's not, but like, is this gonna be another storyline, the same storyline? Mama Joyce is being disrespectful to Todd and Candy's not gonna say anything, like we're doing that again. It's like, we've seen this already. So it's kind of like, this this again, like really, uh, we're over it. Like we're over it. <laughs> 
So Sonia speaks about the little back and forth that she had with Drew at BravoCon. And she feels like Drew acts one way behind closed doors. And then when she's in front of everyone, she gets rah-rah and she starts acting and she starts acting different towards Sonia. And I'm like, uh, Sonia, you really don't have much room to talk because you're a flip flopper. <laughs> so if Drew changes the way that she acts, depending on who she's with, um, hello, uh, pop me kettle. You do the same thing, Sonia. So like, I didn't really care what Sonia was talking about because to me, Sonia's a flip flopper herself. So it's like, girl, like, shut up. Shut up. You do the same thing. Sheree clocks in to defend Martel. Martel, Martel, Martel. And she says Martel is nothing like what we see on TV because if he was like that in person, she wouldn't be attracted to him. Sheree, we don't believe you. Sheree is the type of woman who will do anything and say anything to keep a man. She will defend her man, her man till the end. Sheree is the type who will have proof right in front of her face and she'll still deny it just to keep up appearances. The fact that Sheree gets on this show and insults our intelligence week after week when it comes to Martel, it makes it hard to watch the show because the whole time I'm watching this show, my face is just like, what is she? Are these people serious? I don't even watch, what show is Martell on? Uh, Love and Marriage, Huntsville. I don't even watch that show. I've never seen an episode of that show. And I know about Martell. I've seen enough to know that Martell is no good. So the fact that you're getting on TV and saying, oh, Martell, Martell isn't like that. Martell treats me like this. Martell treats me like that. Are you trying to convince us? You, you don't need to convince us. We already know what it is. It's you who's acting like a complete idiot when it comes to Martel. And it's really embarrassing to see. To see you go from Tyrone to Martel and you're still defending Martel the way that you were defending Tyrone. Have you learned nothing? It's really scary at this point. So Ralph and Drew, our favorite actors, they go on a little hiking trip. <laughs> This couple is so fake to me. Ralph and Drew are so fake to me. They've been acting since they first stepped foot on our TV screens. Every interaction between them, like, I just, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I'm not convinced. It's forced. It's fake. It's phony. So they start talking about Drew getting back into music. And Ralph is like, yeah, we could be like Ike and Tina. Rest in peace, Tina Turner. A legend, a goddess. Rest in peace, Tina Turner. We love you. Ralph says we can be like Ike and Tina. And I'm like, yeah, Ralph, out of all of the couples that you want to emulate, you want to emulate Ike and Tina? Right? Like, that's the couple that comes to mind when you think of your relationship with your wife. Very strange but very telling. So Drew said that her song got 30,000 streams and like a true narcissist, Ralph talks it down and he's like, yeah, that's not that much. And I'm like, wow, instead of celebrating the accomplishment of being an independent artist and getting 30,000 streams, he's downplaying it. When they showed the art for her song and I saw Ralph was in the picture and I'm like, why the fuck would you allow Ralph to be anywhere on your single artwork when he was creating his book, he wouldn't even let you read it. He didn't want you to be on the cover, anything like that. So why are you giving him that exposure on your project when he wouldn't do the same for you? When he didn't do the same for you? Why? Why, Drew? Why? We're into reciprocation over here, okay? I'm gonna give you the energy that you give me. Yeah, he wouldn't be anywhere near anything that I got going on, okay? Like, that. that's how we move in. So next scene, we have Candy showing up to her office looking good. You see those tights that Candy had on? I have a pair of tights like that, same exact tights from Topshop for like 10 years. No exaggeration. <laughs> 10 years. And I've never opened these tights. I've never worn these tights. I was like, hmm, I should go find those tights and put them on. Those tights are sexy. <laughs> but Candy shows up to the candy factory and her and Don Juan start listing her to-do list, the things that she must do. And that list, baby... That list was long, okay? They are showing us that Candy don't have time for Todd and his little productions, okay? <laughs> so Candy is listing everything out. Listing, listing. She got the Soul Train Award. She, she got a lot of stuff going on. And then working on Todd's movie is like the last thing on the list. You can see that whatever Todd wants her to do, whatever Todd has going on, that is not a main priority for her at all. It's, it's, it's an afterthought. Candy does let us know that she would rather produce Todd's movie as opposed to be leading in it because she doesn't want anyone to say, oh, y'all just making this movie so that Candy could star in it. So she wants to produce it, but she does not want to act 
left in the movie. And I understand that because that would take up even more time. She barely has time to do the things that she does now, much less to add on an acting role in Todd's movie, something that she's really not even passionate about. Let's be real. It's looking like the things that Todd wants Candy to do, the things that Todd wants Candy to be a part of, it's like a nuisance to Candy. So Magneta comes over and her and Candy are talking about BravoCon. Magneta asks Candy to fill her in and Don Juan just jumps in. I'm like, boy, she was not talking to you. She was asking Candy, not you, child. Don Juan couldn't wait to talk. And he's like, oh, he was telling her about all the drama that happened, the comment that Mama Joyce made about Todd not having a good job or needing a better job or a real job. We are tired of you, Mama Joyce. We are tired. Mama Joyce comes off as very meddling, very miserable, very lonely, right? And I'm not even saying she's lonely because she's single because being with a man is not the only way to fulfill your life. Being with a man is not the only way to have something to do. But Mama Joyce needs to find her some business, okay? Mama Joyce needs to find a hobby and Candy needs to set boundaries with her relationship with Mama Joyce, because I'm telling you, Mama Joyce only does this continuously because Candy has not checked her. Candy don't check that lady at all. Candy feels like anything that she says that would go against her mother's actions would be disrespectful. And that's not the case, Candy. You can speak up for yourself. You can speak up for your husband. Because if Todd's mom, God rest her soul, if she was alive, right, and she was disrespecting you, I do think that Todd would have checked his mother and be like, Mom, you can't talk to my wife like that. You, you can't talk to my wife like that. So Candy, you should do the same for your husband. So in the next scene, Courtney comes over because we know that Courtney and Ralph, they discovered that they were cousins. Courtney comes over with her ex who was a member of Groove Theory, okay? Tell me if you want me to give you all my time. I want to make it good for you. That's my song, okay? <laughs> but I was still like, um, why did you bring him, <laughs> right? They're not dating. They do share a child together. Their child is grown as hell. She's, what, 24 years old? So if y'all aren't dating, I don't understand why she's bringing him to a double date, like with Ralph. It's really weird. It's good that they're friends and they have a good co-parenting relationship, but going out together, that's strange to me. I don't, I, it seems like Courtney brought him over so we can see, so she can be like, hey, y'all, look who my baby daddy is because I really don't see the reason why she brought him to the dinner. Like, why, why is he here? Like, okay. <laughs> but when Courtney comes over, Drew calls Candy and she's like, hey, look who's here. And Candy, I, I love Candy for this because she's like, yeah, why are you calling me? Like, you know I don't mess with this girl. And Drew, being fake as hell, is like, what? I would, I'm not trying to be fake. I'm not trying to start drama. I, I didn't even know it was that serious. Bro, Ralph told you at Ross's party, these two almost fought. It almost got physical between these two. So why when she comes over, the first person that you call is Candy. And you're like, hey, Candy, look who's at my house. Like, you know what's up, Drew. And then why act fake about it? I can't stand people who do that. Like, you're trying to be messy and you're trying to pass it off as if, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know it was that serious. You knew. You knew. So Candy and Drew get off the phone and Drew lets Courtney know Candace from Real Housewives of Potomac is having a performance and she asked Drew to be a part of that performance. So Courtney says, look, I'd love to come. I'd love to support you, but not if it's going to make things awkward, which kind of caught me by surprise, right? Because the way that we saw Courtney acting in episode one, I would think that she would jump at the opportunity to be around Candy again and to act the fool all over again, right? So I was honestly surprised by that. So it is time for Candace's show. We see Drew arrive early to the sound check. Candace looks amazing. She sounds amazing. The song sounds really good. And it's really inspiring to see her living her dream, doing exactly what she said that she was going to do. It's finally showtime and all of the ladies are showing up. Sheree doesn't come and I'm like, thank God, because I'm tired of seeing Sheree on my screen. And of course, if Sheree came, Martel would come and it would just be a whole mess. I'm happy that Sheree faked being sick and stayed her ass home because we don't need to see you, Sheree. Candace's mic was on, honey, okay? She had her Beyonce fan. The, the hair was blowing. The mic was on. She sounded and looked amazing. Drew comes on stage and sings like two lines and everyone's like... That, that's it. I was sitting there. I was like, that's that's all she gonna sing? She not even a song like hell. She could have sang uh, the national anthem or something. <laughs> like she really sang 
two lines. And I was like, yeah, girl, what? Production was shady as hell. They actually showed the length of Drew's performance. It was like 43 seconds. Like, girl, you had us all come out for 43 seconds. Like, we could have stayed home. We could have watched that on YouTube, okay? We did not have to come get all dolled up and come here to watch you sing for less than a minute, literally. So after the show, all the ladies go backstage, and Kenya asked Drew, like, girl, why was this so sure? And Drew's like, I just really came to support Candace. This was really about her and just an opportunity for me to get my feet wet, get back out there, get back on the stage, right? Drew and Sonya make up from the issue at BravoCon. I really don't care about this beef between Drew and Sonya, if you can't tell. It's like, girl, I don't really care about it. Um, then Candy confronts Courtney on the comments that she made about Candy bringing the hood out, bringing the ghetto out. And immediately when Courtney responds, she's like, ah, nah, nah, and, I, nah, nah, nah. and I'm like, girl, you need to chill out. Courtney is very confrontational. She doesn't know how to communicate without bringing a level five up to a level 50. It doesn't take all of this hand clapping and like every conversation does not have to be that. But she says she's ghetto and she's from the ghetto and Candy's like, okay, well, if you identify with being ghetto, then why are you making it seem like ghetto people coming to my show is a negative thing? Candy says she's thankful for everyone who comes out. That means that she has people who support her from all walks of life. Like what's like, what's the problem? The ghetto dollar is worth just as much as the classy dollar. Like they, hello. They, she's still getting her money. Then Manietta and Marlo get into it for a little bit. This scene, it was just like, this scene was just everyone like, I don't know, like hashing out whatever issue that they had, but it was so unnatural. It was like, okay, you go. Okay, can you go? Okay, now now Drew and Sonya, now y'all go. Okay, now Courtney and Candy, now y'all go. Right? It was it was so unnatural and I was just sitting there like <sighs> I'm bored. Then Drew very again unnaturally brings up the situation that happened at Candy's restaurant, Blaze. And she's like, oh, Candy, right? Did just something happen at your restaurant? And Marlo's like, what happened? When? Oh, the shooting? Oh, the shooting? Marlo, I'm tired of Marlo. <laughs> I'm tired of Marlo. Marlo couldn't wait to talk about this. And when she brings it up and she's like, oh, the shooting? Candy's like, yeah, that's private. That's a personal matter. Now, I do agree with Marlo in the sense that Candy should have to talk about that, but I can also understand Candy not being able to talk about that if it's currently going through the court system, right? So I get both sides of it. What I don't get is how angry Marlo got because of this situation. Like, it was really strange. So when Candy says that it's a personal matter, Marlo gets up and she's like, okay, she kind of breaks the fourth wall and she's like, okay, I'm gonna leave because Candy doesn't have to talk about what she don't wanna talk about. Like, it's not fair. And Candy's like, okay, well, let's talk about you cutting that girl in the face. <laughs> girl, <laughs> I gagged, I gagged. That was too funny. And Marlo's like, okay, let's talk about it. That was 20 something years ago. Y'all always like to bring up my past. Y'all always like to bring up my mug shots. I don't care. We could talk about it. And then that's how that scene ended. Then they really break the fourth wall because after that, we get some footage between Drew and Marlo. Marlo is upset with Drew because she doesn't like that when Drew was bringing up the situation that happened at Blaze, Drew didn't use the word shooting. So Marlo wanted Drew to say what happened to the shooting that happened at Blaze. And because Drew didn't phrase it like that, and you can see that's what Marla was trying to pull out of her because she was like, what happened? What event? Oh, the shooting? Because Drew didn't phrase it the way that Marla wanted her to phrase it. She blew up on Drew when she started bringing up her nephew. Marlo says that the reason why she's really upset is because she has a nephew who passed away due to gun violence. And this nephew, worked with Candy at OLG. Marlo says that she text messaged Candy about the situation, told her what happened, and then the next day when they were in person and they were filming, Candy acted like she had no idea that Marlo's nephew passed away, right? I can understand how obviously that is something that still affects Marlo, something that Marlo is really hurt by, but I don't understand how that made her blow up at Drew. She stormed out of there yelling in Drew's face. First of all, girl, <laughs> <laughs> Drew, you better than me because she would have got mushed. Marlo would have got mushed, okay? But she stormed out of there yelling, her nephew is dead, her nephew is dead. And I, that episode left me like, what the f I'm like, what? Like, y'all, I don't know how much more of this season I can watch. 
I'm going to try to keep watching it so I can keep reviewing it. But let me know what y'all think below of this episode. I am going to try to continue to watch Real Housewives of Atlanta. But it's not doing it for me. It's really not. Tell me if it's doing it for you, honey, because... I don't know, y'all. I don't know. But anyway, thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts, and we'll talk about it below. Bye!